Yeah, does anybody <clears throat> does anybody mind doing the co-host thing so we can and just um also if there's people in the waiting room that would be like helpful. I'm happy to press buttons okay. that folks in okay. out. Yeah, great. Okay, so Kate, let me see. Sorry, I'm just getting set up here. Participants and chat. Okay, now make co-host. Okay, I think you are now co-host, Kate. Okay, great. All right, thank you for for being a um, a community here. <laughs> okay, so if you go to the standards page and click on Audubon Core, this basically tells you what all the parts are of Audubon Core. The part of Audubon Core that people are the most familiar with is the main vocabulary, and that's the first document here. But there's a couple of other ancillary documents that I'll mention at least one of them, which is a structure document, which explains how you can stru structure Audubon Core records. There's also a guide and an introduction with some um, some general information. And then there's three controlled vocabularies, which are also listed here. If you go to the uh, term list, which is probably the most important page, um, the term list, you can go to the vocabulary indices. There's a whole bunch of terms and they're divided up into categories. Um, so if you want a particular type of term, you can look for them here. And then when you click on this, it'll drop, it'll drop you down to the term metadata. At the top of the list, there's also some menus here. Um, and this is how you can jump in between um, the uh, the different controlled vocabularies. So for example, here's the format controlled vocabulary, which has controlled value terms for different uh, media types. Uh, and, and the other two are there as well. And then there's also a link to the two guides that I mentioned. So this is kind of how you can um, find all the pieces of Audubon Core and how they're used. With respect to this group, the, um, the Audubon Core maintenance group, um, there is a GitHub repository, which I think is probably linked from that landing page, um, where you can just go uh, to the uh, GitHub got GitHub dot com slash tadwid slash ac and i will just throw that in the chat as well where did my chat go uh here it is okay um and so this is like actually where the the work of the group gets done so one of the thing useful things here <clears throat> is there's a list of the core members of the group um not necessary to be a core member to participate. Um, core members are people mostly who commit to show up and help do work. And also if you know if the convener is unable to um, convene, as is the case today, <laughs> Ed Baker, who is our convener, isn't able to be here today. And so um, other core members can pick up for that if, if the convener is not able to do things. Um, this repository is where we keep all of the records. So for instance, there's a historical thing here. This is like all of the meeting notes for every meeting back to forever. Um, and it's also where some of the work that we've been doing on different sorts of topics are found. So the views controlled vocabularies, which we'll talk about is in this folder. And then some of the work we've been doing on sounds is in here. So basically it's a place where we stash all the stuff that we're working um, on. The maintenance group itself, if you're not familiar with the idea of what a maintenance group is, there is a, um, a Tadwig standards document called the um, Vocabulary Maintenance Specification. And it basically um, explains sort of the rules for how you maintain a vocabulary. So right now, there are two active maintenance groups. There's the, this one, which maintains Audubon Core. There's a Darwin Core maintenance group. And then um, TCS actually has a maintenance group, but their vocabulary is sort of under revision, so they're not that active. And, and hopefully ABCD will soon have a maintenance group if they get their charter um, 
So anyway, maintenance groups job, they're basically permanent interest groups whose job it is to maintain the, um, the standard. And so um, the, the, how the maintenance groups works really depends on the vocabulary. Some groups have like regular meetings, Darren Core maintenance group just has meetings whenever they need to. Um, so that's kind of all over the map. But one of the things that the VMS says, the vocabulary maintenance specification says is that at least once a year, you should kind of go through your open issues and review them to make sure that nothing is languishing uh, that people care about. And so historically, uh, for at least the last three or four um, years, we've had a meeting, an annual meeting associated with the Tadwig annual meeting, or in this case with the working sessions, where we invite the community to come in and, uh, and learn about us, but also to provide us with some input about our future directions. So, um, so that's what we do. And, and when we take action on proposed changes, to uh, the vocabulary, uh, it, it falls on the maintenance group to manage that um, that change process, which again is described in the um, vocabulary maintenance specification. Uh, let's see, I guess I should have probably put a link to that in the chat. Ah, okay. I can grab that if. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Yeah. If you don't mind doing that, that'd be great. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, that's what we do. And, and in addition to sort of doing this like um, routine maintenance work, we also try to do some thinking and some planning about future directions for Audubon Corps. And we have several items that are on the agenda for today that we'll talk about. Um, and, and hopefully we can get some ideas from you as well. So uh, does anybody uh, want to unmute or, uh, or throw questions in the chat about um, what exactly Audubon Corps is and what this group does? OK, well, feel free at any time to jump in with questions. So I thought that I would just do kind of a review of some of the things that we worked on last year. Um, as I mentioned in our GitHub repository, there's minutes of uh, like our past meetings. And <laughs> I basically went through them and tried to see what were the things we did and what were the things that are sort of left undone. So one of the things um, which we talked about, um, but which didn't really lead to any concrete action is, um, the alignment between the CAMTRAP DP group. Um, this is a effort, I don't know if it's officially out of the machine observations interest group, but certainly the people in the machines observations interest group are involved in developing this specification. So right now, camera trap uh, DP stands for uh, data packages. So it's a data packages based um, uh, specification for describing how to package up cam camera trap data. And so we had some discussions, Peter Desmond, who's one of the lead authors on that specification and also involved in that group, came to one of our meetings and, and we talked a bit about um, sort of a, alignment with Audubon Core. So right now it's not a Tadwig specification, although um, it's possible that it will become one. And so, one of the goals within Tadwig is to sort of harmonize the various um, specifications so that everybody's not reinventing the wheel. Um, one of the things that came out of this discussion um, is they there's an important um, uh, concept that they have of a, a, like a sequence of images. So if you have like a burst of images from a camera trap, you want to have some way of relating that sequence of images to each other. And when we were talking about this, we realized there are other circumstances where we have um, related images, like, for example, a stack of images that might make up a 3D uh, data set or, uh, uh, or some other kinds of things, like regions of interest where we have multiple ones of those, 
for each uh, image. And so the issue of how we um, structure Audubon core serializations in the case when they're not flat um, is, is something that we're interested in pursuing and actually on the issue tracker, one of the items there is potentially rewriting the structure document. So just for historical background, um, originally Audubon Core only had one main class of things and that was media items. And there was a second class, which is service access points. And those are um, like specific um, instances of files of media items. And so you could have like a thumbnail and a full resolution version and a web resolution. And these would all be service access points of an abstract image media item. So the original structure document really only had to deal with that one level of, of um, normalization. And so there was kind of, I, I would say sort of a kludgy um, solution for that that are suggested in the document. But now we've complicated things by adding regions of interest and, and other possible things, camera bursts and whatever. And so how you handled this, these more complicated relationships among media related items is, an, is um, an, a topic of active interest of the task group. And I'll, I'll bring that up again later. Um, anybody of uh, people who attended this have any uh, attended these meetings have any um, thing they want to clarify or add to that? All right, if yes. not, I'll just yeah, go ahead. Maybe just a quick note there. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it. There was a little camp trap webinar yesterday where um, it was not so little, it was pretty big. Um, and they walked through, I guess, some of the approaches that they're taking within that um, using like frictionless um, JSON and things like that, where across other standards, Audubon Core included, um, we've been looking also at JSON LD and some of those ways of implementing examples in those different flavors of um, JSON or whatever format suits a given person's use um, case. And so also considering those other service access point types of fields where we have nested info, um, something that, yeah, would be nice to figure out a flexible, but more consistent way that we can kind of chug through it, especially knowing that it's a thing that other standards are struggling with a little bit too. Yeah, just to follow up on what Kate said, um, there, this actually um, was uh, under discussion at the technical architecture group. So the technical architecture group's job is basically to try to um, smooth the way between different standards, um, help them be more interoperable, help to figure out like what the best practices are so that each task group doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. And so this topic of how you handle these like more complex values or, or nested values um, actually got kind of added to the agenda. So hopefully we can get together some of the stakeholders. I know there's like within Humboldt Core and, um, and, and other, um, uh, the uh, Latimer Core, there's a number of groups that have, that, that want to handle this kind of more complex data. And, and, and certainly JSON has been brought up as a possible way to do that. And it, it works quite well for structuring data. If you're like an API, if you're just trying to do spreadsheets, it's a little um, less useful. So hopefully we, I think I actually put that on the agenda here somewhere that the, um, that the anyway, the technical architecture group will, will hopefully take this up and maybe get some of the uh, some buy-in from the different groups who have this problem so that we can come up with maybe a consensus solution. So thanks for that, Kate. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I don't wanna get too long-winded about the this review here. Uh, so I'll just mention one of the things that came up uh, that also has come up sort of tad week wide is how do you map things from one vocabulary to another? And, and this also isn't, area of active interest within the tag 
Um, one of the things that we've done here in Audubon Core this year was to use the term SAWS DLRDF colon model reference, which is kind of a, um, an obscure term, but it's a W3C term that basically you can use to link a term to some other term that, um, that defines that, that from which the definition of your subject term comes. And, and the reason we're using it is in one of our controlled vocabularies, the, um, the uh, subtype vocabulary, we've defined those as classes. And, but the definitions for those classes we got from the Getty Arts and Architecture Thesaurus, which is uses SCOS concepts. And so rather than trying to assert somehow that a class is the same thing as a SCOS concept, we're just using this term to make a link. And, and the uh, draft views controlled vocabulary does a similar thing, only it's the other way around. In that case, those controlled vocabulary terms are SCOS concepts and we want to link them to oboe ontology terms that are classes. So again, we're using this to make a machine readable link um, between uh, two different kinds of things that, that we want to assert basically mean the same thing, even though technically they're not the same kind of thing. So is this the best solution for mapping? I don't know, we just kind of like threw the gauntlet down and said, we're gonna try this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, whether that's the best practice or not, I don't know, but we sort of set that as a, a precedent for one way to do that. Um, okay, uh, the other big thing that's ha that's been happening this year, um, so the maintenance group has two task groups that they sponsor. One of them is the Views Controlled Vocabulary Task Group, which I'm the convener of, and thankfully we are like done. I'm so excited about that. So we're the the all everything is tied up with a bow. We have uh, there's an issue in the issue tracker that's linked here, which is the proposal, and it's currently under public comment until December seventh. Um, so far, uh, there's been a few suggestions. Mostly, the comments have been positive. So unless something really bad happens between now and the seventh it seems promising that this is going to get ratified and the task group will be done. So I'm not going to go through, I, I put a lot of links here about things that we did. I will just say that one thing that we did do that <clears throat> I would say is somewhat innovative, the um, vocabulary maintenance specification has some guidelines for coordinated additions to a vocabulary. So, and, and this basically means if you wanna add something to a vocabulary that rises above just changing a single term, you're changing a whole bunch of terms or you're telling people how those terms should be used together or whatever, that's what the, the VMS considers a vocabulary enhancement. And so the best practice that it defines is that you should um, create two documents, one which is called a, um, Let's see, what is it called? A, now I forget what it's called. Anyway, basically where you are um, explaining what that vocabulary has to, I think it's a user feedback report or something like that. And in our case, what we did is collected use cases and use those to create requirements for what we are doing. So that the published list of requirements meets that first, um, the first, uh, Thing that the VMS says you should do. And then the second thing, once you're almost done, is you should test what you're doing and then report the result of the testing in an implementation experience report. So we, um, we created uh, some guidelines for testing in February. We had a little workshop for the potential testers. And then during March and April, we had a number of groups who tested the controlled vocabularies. We put that together in a report which uh, it, there's a link to the draft of that report and we've submitted it as a, an article to Tadwig's journal, BIS. So the, the thing that's innovative about this is that, you know, there, there are other groups who've created implementation experience reports, but making it into a BIS article, we, were, we offered to the test implementers co-authorship. <laughs> so the carrot 
for taking the time to participate in the testing, which otherwise would be a very thankless job, is that you get to be a co-author of a published paper. So, and that seemed to work quite well. The it gave those testers a um, uh, a vested interest in the outcome of of this, and and also, hopefully, people will be more widely aware of what we did when the paper comes out. So that we're kind of proud of, of pulling that off. Although it is a lot more work than just throwing some stuff in a markdown document and <laughs> posting it on GitHub, which would be sort of the minimum requirement for that. Uh, so the, the last thing that I'll say about that is not done. I mean, it's done in the sense that we, we have control, controlled vocabulary terms for a number of organism groups that are important like plants and insects and mammals, but there are some other groups like fungi and ferns and bryophytes, which we know should have terms, but we didn't have the expertise on our team to develop controlled vocabulary terms for those uh, organism groups. So, and, and there is interest in adding those terms. So one of the things about a Tadwig vocabulary is that it lives and can be added to. And so hopefully we can um, get some, recruit some experts from those uh, communities who are uh, able to, um, to bring bring those additional terms into the controlled vocabulary. So we'll have the controlled vocabularies there and they will be able to be added to just like other control like other vocabularies. Deb, hey. Maybe you're gonna open it up for questions later so we can table this no, for, if that's questions necessary. are good now. Questions well, one of my questions now. would be out of I guess it's out of curiosity but also out of data use. Has anyone looked at what those groups are using in the data that we have compiled in GBIF right now? What terms? For, so, so for, like for describing it, parts of organisms? Yeah. yeah. So for the groups that you named that don't have anything yet, d does the data they've already provided give us any hints about if we clustered the terms that they're already using, um, can we know something already about the way Envo you know, was built, peer, yeah. or whatever, the way they took they took existing data and looked for the clusters and. Well, uh, if we could find that, that would be the perfect way to do it. I, the problem is that I, and I, somebody who's more familiar with GBIV might be able to answer this, but my understanding is that the Audubon core extension isn't as widely used as the, there's like two ways that you can associate media items. Yeah. And there's the simple way and I right. think that's what most people do. And, and it so doesn't have that to, data in it, right? Yeah, so to be yeah. able to have that information, people would have to be using the Audubon core extension and they would have to be providing those two fields. I don't think we've ever looked for this. I so think it would I was, certainly, sorry. it would be a good starting point if, uh, if we could find that. So I, I guess someone could, ah, so that's a good point, Ben. Um, that pointing out the other media extension is deprecated. That's two points you made from my point of view. It would be good to find out from GBIF in general if the use of extensions is going up because one of the challenges we had in the past, let's say eight, seven years ago, would be that there were extensions existed that were really useful and powerful, but people were not using them for a variety of all the reasons, right? All the reasons. How, how do they get it out in the IPT? Do they understand what to put in it? Do they know how to map their data from their database out to it? All, all the reasons. So one would be, is extension use going up? It's nice in GBIF now for those of you, probably everybody here is aware, but if you didn't, you can actually look now to see what extensions are used and when you're searching the data. You can see that information. And the other point I would make there is, Steve, I was actually thinking about things like the way in which people use dynamic properties or um, in general, gra grabbing the data around a particular group, like you mentioned, fungi, and more evaluating their text for clusters and seeing if in their notes field, in their occurrence remarks, where are they putting the information that says, you know, if I have an image, did they put some extra information that tells you what's in it, what it's about? Um, usage stats for extensions would be awesome. They're, they're in the, uh, if you go to occurrence searching, um, ben, you can, when you're picking on like advanced instead of basic, 
um, you can go down and there's a thing about extensions and you can actually see. But what would be nice, like that's what I was asking is, does Tim or GBIF have data to show us that the use of extensions is going up? I think the answer is yes. Um, the other statistic he used about controlled vocabularies was in his recent talk, was that the number of times they have to ping something as being an error is actually getting smaller. Cool. He's got that. That's a pretty cool metric that they're keeping. Um, ben, you'll, yeah. you'll have to uh, ask GBIF. And sorry, sorry. So my question, Steve, was could we use the data we have to learn more about some of those vocabulary? I think that's an excellent idea. And I think we should put that on our uh, list, a to do list. The other thing I was just going to note is I'm not sure, you know, over the past several years, we've made a number of changes to Audubon Core, such as, in, in, um, well, changing some of the term definitions or usage guidelines a little bit to make use of these new controlled vocabularies that we've created. And I'm not sure that that's all updated in the IPT. So we actually have an open issue that says, which I think you can see on my screen, that we should make sure that the AC, that the Audubon Core IPT extension is actually up to date. So yeah, great, great idea of a future uh, thing to do. It sounds um, like somebody who wants to do data mining, right? And do a little yeah. bit of <laughs> so, magic. So um, I will, I, I'm going to move on here just um, because I, I want to talk about like the work of the upcoming year, which this is uh, actually a good segue, Deb. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I want to mention before we go on is that um, there has been an ongoing discussion in the task group about um, the about John J. Audubon and his legacy of, of being a slaveholder and the appropriateness of of naming a standard after him. And uh, and this sort of came up ge in general, I think at one of the executive meetings, like, do we have any policy about naming standards after people? And I think the answer was no. And so, you know, we we, we have Latimer Core coming out. And so I don't think naming standards after people is gonna go away because it's, it's happening. But there was a desire in the maintenance group to um, either officially or at least as a working name to rebrand as audiovisual core or Avi core for short instead of Audubon core. Um, and that would allow us to continue using AC as our brand. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as a, I don't think any minutes got put up of our last meeting, but we basically, at the last maintenance group meeting, we basically decided we wanted to move for, forward with this. And I think maybe I was, <laughs> I think I was supposed to mention this at an executive committee meeting, but um, I think I didn't, Deb. So anyway, ping. <laughs> um, so what exact? I so we one of the things we discussed is like how what's the mechanism for doing this? And the conclusion was, okay, we're the standard maintenance group. It's a change to the standard, like everything else. We can propose it, have public comment on it, and and uh, you know make it a change like other changes we make to the standard. Or we could just uh, use a sort of doing business as approach like corporations who don't officially change their name, but just start referring to themselves as something else. So anyway, we, we haven't quite figured out how to roll this out, but I think there was a decision made that this was something the maintenance group thought we should do. Okay, so that's basically a summary of last year. And what I did was uh, go through the issue tracker, which if, um, well, actually, before I go on, <laughs> are there any comments or thoughts people have about what, what I just said? Yeah, Jennifer. Um, I don't know if you commented on this because I got here late, but uh, I would like to note that the entire vocabularies are also available in Spanish at this point, which I think is a huge thing for reaching to other communities within Tadwig. Yes, thank you for, I, I actually have that in the notes, uh, but I forgot to highlight that. So th kudos to you, Jennifer, for doing that translation. And we'd actually lo love to make the new, voc the, the new subject part and subject orientation vocabularies available in other languages as well, if there's willing translators. 
So, um, but Jennifer did the hard work of, of doing the Spanish translation. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, so any more com thoughts or comments about the rebranding issue uh, or renaming issue? I just wanna make a general comment that, I mean, I think the sensitivity question and the thoughtfulness is, is important. Um, I think the policy from Tadwig could come out, but our general consensus was taking care. We appreciated why people wanted to use, for example, Latimer Core as a balancing point to naming after a woman as opposed to all of them being named after men that have names, um, but also being aware that there's a branding issue to consider about a standard uh, name telling you what that standard is about. Just that very yeah. basic branding about um, your, what what is your product and when you're trying to yeah. explain to people what it's all about. So your your name change also gets at that issue. Right. That was a that was definitely one of the pluses of that particular choice. And and I should say one of the reasons I think why we haven't rolled this out yet is that there was a a belief in the group that we need to have an explanation for why we're making the name change and put it somewhere prominently and we haven't done that yet so um so that's still on the to-do list um okay so what i've done when in the past when i was the chair of this group which i'm not anymore we tried to go through the issue tracker and sort of figure out um as i said earlier like what has been languishing and in the interest of time, I went through the issue tracker prior to um, the uh, the meeting and tried to put, I think, the lowest hanging fruit at the top. And uh, so I've I've put the things that I would like to talk about um, first, and then um, if we have time, we can look at some. There's some other issues that have been kind of stuck in the issue tracker, mostly for lack of a champion to move them forward. And um, we may, at another meeting, decide whether to just give up on those or not. But the thing that I wanted to highlight um, first was uh, issue number 246. Um, <clears throat> so when the views controlled vocabulary group started and we collected use cases. One of the use cases that seemed important to multiple people was having some way to say, is a part of an image a label or not? And there currently isn't any straightforward way to do that. What ended up happening was the views task group decided that this was really out of scope because our charge was to develop these controlled vocabularies for subject part and subject orientation of the organism and the label is not an organism. So we kind of punted this back to the maintenance group and said like, this is something that really needs to be done, but we're not the group to do that. So we, th there had been some discussion about possible approaches uh, with nothing very concrete. And so I just decided at the same time I was writing up the proposal for the views, I wrote up a proposal of a way one of the solutions we discussed to how to do this. Um, so I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about this because I think it's not complicated. And I also think, so it's a low hanging fruit and it's all, also a high value um, thing because like I said, it's something that people say they really want. So just to, in a nutshell, there's already an existing term in Audubon Core that's, I don't even know how to say this, IPTC for XMP EXT colon CV term with CV term standing for controlled value term. And the controlled value, the, the definition, let's see if I can make this pop up here. Uh, yes, open that. Uh, okay. Let me see here. A term to describe the content of the image by a value from a controlled vocabulary. What could be more straightforward than that? You want to tell have a controlled vocabulary to tell people this is a label. So we have basically a term for that. Now the usage guidelines are a little kind of idiosyncratic. And so just for kind of historical background, 
within Audubon Corps, we have a convention. And, and if you look at the vocabulary indices, you'll see there's commenter, commenter literal. There's, uh, let's see. Well, where are the other Provider, ones? provider literal. I yeah, that. exactly. There's, subject there's a part, bunch of- Subject part literal. Part yeah. literal, yes. So we have a convention that if a term is intended to have a literal value, that we have a separate term than ones that have IRI values. And the problem with, um, uh, okay, wait, now I, I lost my place here, okay. The problem with this is th this kind of, th the actual IPTC um, guidelines say that this term is supposed to have an IRI value or something like that. And this term sort of fudges that by saying, well, you should have an IRI unless it's like an Audubon Core approved thing, in which case you can just throw in a string. So uh, in this proposal, I'd like to clean that up a little bit and just say, if you have an IRI, then use this term. So when we create controlled vocabularies, which um, if you look at uh, the controlled vocabularies, uh, the, this isn't the best one, let's do a different one. Um, if you look at the controlled vocabularies, you'll notice that each term has a controlled value string, uh, and then it also has a URI. And so the controlled the controlled value string is what you use in like a spreadsheet, and the IRI is what you use in like um, linked data or whatever. And so the proposal that I made was to use the existing term the way it was intended, which is for IRIs, and then use something else for the controlled value strings. So really the only thing that is sort of unsettled about this proposal is what term we should use for the controlled value strings if we separate them out in this way. I suggested using Audubon core tag because that's basically like a textual tag for the thing. I'm not sure that's a good idea because the guidelines for tag are very loose. Just basically like put in some strings that you want to tag this with. And I think this, in this case, we want it to be much more controlled. So another possibility would be to create an Audubon core analog called AC CV term literal. And that one would be expected to be used with the literal value string. So other than that, I think it's fairly straightforward. I've actually suggested based on our discussion what, what some of the um, possible ones would be. So here's label, color bar, spoken introduction for parts of recordings. And then if it is an actual organism part, we could say that, and then you would, that would be with the understanding that like, okay, if it's an organism part, then you're probably gonna have a subject part and a subject orientation uh, value as well. Um, so, so we have some suggestions for the controlled vocabulary. The real issue is like, what, wh how do we handle the controlled string terms? And that's, I think, really what's kind of holding this proposal up. So does anybody have any thoughts about that or suggestions? Yeah, Deb. I was gonna say, give us a second to to reframe it again. I, could you state it shortly again? Then what the challenge is? Just so we're yeah. Uh, let's see. Actually, let me just put the notes document here. It's this. What do we do for um, controlled vocabulary strings? So for an IRI, which is um, essentially yeah. a URL. We go. We use the existing term. Got this it. one. Okay. The question is, what do we do if we're telling people to use a string? So if if okay. we're telling them to use a controlled string label, mm -hmm. currently we just say throw it in under this term, but that's not that's not following the con the normal conventions in Audubon Core, which is to maintain the separation in between. between terms that should have IRIs and terms that should have strings. We're so, conflating those two things here. So is it, do we use AC tag? 
do we use DC terms description or do we mint a new term that's mm. called CV term literal? So it's not exactly following the pattern. We are so. speaking literal on there, but like this is a term we borrowed from a different namespace. So we can't make IPT C for XMV CV term literal okay. because it's not our term. So before I add my idea, does anybody have thoughts on that? Because I don't, I'm, I have a tangential idea, but I don't want to derail the conversation. Dan is smiling. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, um, I guess uh, everyone would probably think their suggestion was tangential. <laughs> okay, that makes me feel better, actually. Thank you for saying that. All right, go for it, Deb. But Okay, in my brain, and, and maybe I've gone off the rails, but again, you all are lovely at sort of framing, reframing if I need it. I appreciate that. For me, and I appreciate David's, okay, yeah, you'll have, you'll have to speak up then after me. So for me, I started, I put the link to the renewed description to create a term called verbatim label. For those of us who are very herbarium focused and entomology focused or whatever you want, that think about these labels and we very much want the literal what's on the label kind of field. And I think that's finally going to happen. So it occurred to me, yeah. this seems to be an opportunity to say, here's the label over here. And well, oh, by the way, here's the content. And so yeah. those two terms somehow would be connected. I think if we wanted to say what's on the label, so so what we're talking about has a different purpose. Um, yeah. Although, as you say, there we what we want to do is say this is a label. Yeah. And yeah. this term says this is what the text of the label is. Mm. So they're not the same thing, although mm. they should be related. If there is a label, we'd love to tell people what what's is on it. Yeah, or yeah. a certain, we're, the other thing that I thought about, and I wondered how that played a role here, didn't basis of record at some point have a term in it, I forget what it was called, that would refer to an image or something, a label, that it being, it was a label, I can't try I to remember. I don't remember that. Mm. I'm trying, mm. to, I might be mess, missing or mixing DC terms type, like physical. The, yeah, I, I'm not as, sure. Uh, I, so this, the the place where this would really come out is in you know we created this regions of interest uh set mm -hmm. of terms for defining mm -hmm. like parts of an image and this is where that's really going to come out mm -hmm. where we somebody has divided said like okay i have an herbarium specimen here's the um leaf here's the here's where the leaf is on the image here's where the flower mm -hmm. is on the image and here's mm -hmm. where the label is on the image that's where the or, yeah. yeah so it might be a part of an image or in the case of like digitizing an insect you might just have a picture of the label because mm -hmm. it's you know like stacked on a pin underneath the specimen so yeah. it could be used either for an entire image or a part of an image but it's it's really to it's and it's yeah and it's not really it's not really a type term because the type of the thing is image or region of interest. Correct. What Got we're it. doing is saying what is depicted in, in this it. thing. Yeah. And that we don't, I don't think we really have a term for that. David, do you want to throw your thing on the table? <laughs> sure, I can, can just, um, as I said, personal preference without really having thought about that in that much of detail. But I'd say uh, uh, we should go with uh, CB term literal. Um, so the uh, the idea is we used the, the other term because it was appropriate and uh, that's what we needed. But now we realize, okay, we need something else as well. That's not part of the original namespace. So we just create the corresponding term in our own namespace and um, uh, adhere to our convention with the literal. literal. And I would, even go with the uh, um, both uh, C and V in capitalized form to to have this. I think you're right about that. Tandem, just one is from different namespace because it's it's reused, and the other one is um, uh, yeah the corresponding one. So I, I guess yeah. this is the the least confusing uh, version, at least from from my point of view, being a bit familiar with the subject. <laughs> I, th I, I think I agree with that. And I, I mean, I, I put the lower 
camel case version just because that's the pattern, but I think it's more important to have them match, to, to have the, the convention that we follow, which is the label or the literal version, it has exactly the same local name, except you stick label on the end of it. I, I think that's, and I, and I think I, I sort of retract my initial suggestion of using tag because I think tag is really a different thing. Tag is really just kind of like put whatever you want in here. And this, we really are expecting a, con a, a, a single controlled vocabulary term for each of each thing that we're talking about. And, and to go to Ben's question, is a label in this class case which would require an array? I would say it would require a perhaps a complex array in the sense that it would be an array of 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 um uh sorry i'm blanking on it um regions of interest it's an array of regions of interest and those regions of interest would have one property that would say what is it and that would be the value of this term and other properties like the x and y pixel positions and things like that so I, I'm not sure there would be an array, a, a simple array, if that makes sense. Well, I, I so I guess I would say I feel like actually quite in agreement with what uh, David said, and I guess I would propose just changing the proposal <laughs> to do that, and then I guess the question is like, do, is I probably at our next regular meeting, we should think about it and come to a decision as to whether this is ready for public comment or to go to public comment or whether it needs more work. I think this is another case where the suggested um, values are the ones I could think of. And undoubtedly, there are other ones that we haven't thought of, but it's extensible, right? So as long as the ones that we have here make sense, um, we could go ahead and do it. So, okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop. And the reason is because I think, uh, let's see, Adam is here, yes. And I'm, so I'm gonna skip over, um, I already talked about B updating the structure document. So here's the link to what the technical architecture group is doing. Okay, so check. Um, and then there's other issues, but we probably won't have time for that. So I wanted to, if someone from the 3D, uh, well, actually also Kate is here, but if one or more people from the 3D group would like to explain sort of like where they are, what the, what the issues are and where they're going, I would love to have that. Um, so Adam, do you wanna do that or Kate, or is there anybody else? Uh, got Doug here too. Yeah, I was going to say. Is Doug here? Oh, Doug is here. Sorry, I missed that. That's okay. I do want to talk I was about one. To hide. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I do want to mention ahead. one yeah. specific issue, but I think Doug will have yeah. a better sense of the overall status. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, sort of everything flows from the the issue that Adam um, has to mention, um, but. Uh, but generally speaking, I think we have a pretty good vocabulary together. I mean, we base, we've sort of focused on, um, you, you know, really strictly on the 3D-ness of uh, the media. And we have sort of three, I guess, sort of three categories of terms that in, in the proposal. Um, we have you know, we've tried to do our, you know, our due diligence um, in terms of finding borrowed, finding existing terms and borrowing them wherever, wherever they are available. Um, <clears throat> but uh, sort of our focus has been to, um, to focus on uh, terms for basic discoverability, um, according to the image, according to the resource creation method, and according to, um, sort of the, the way the data is encoded in the file, something we call file type, not the same as format. Um, but then, um, and then we have another class of terms that are essentially um, designed to help 
the file be read and interpreted accurately. Um, there are a number of 3D formats that, um, you know, it's not, obviously it's not just like um, loading a photo into, you know, into, into you know, your, um, into Photoshop or something like that, where, where you know that X and Y are the same dimension, that sort of thing. A lot of 3D formats have a 3D, uh, well, they, they have, you know, specific dimensions or real world dimensions along each of the three um, pixel or voxel axes that are not reliably encoded within the file. So they need to be um, reported, up, you know, upon submi submission. So that's, that's one sort of class. And then there are just a number of, um, uh, there's a number of sort of ad hoc uh, terms that specify things like how is color encoded in the file. Um, and uh, so that's, that's where I, I mean, we're basically we're our I think where we're where we've been stuck at right now is just how to put together the final documentation, sort of the feature report and the um, what is the other thing the uh, the the implementation experience implementation experience yeah so we've just been sort of been struggling to get uh, to to uh, to get organized there. Um, <clears throat> The committee um, is composed of people from different institutions that all have 3D, um, have, have pretty involved 3D production and archiving and publication workflows. So, you know, we feel like the implementation report can mostly be done by, by the committee, um, but, uh, but we have to do it. And the other thing is, um, we also feel like it would it could still be useful to have a, you know a slightly broader uh, perspective. And actually, with a meeting that we just we just came from another um, standards meeting, uh, one folk one run by um, Adam, uh, focused on three D data. And that that group has been somewhat involved in the development of this. But I feel like it could be beneficial to um, have them put uh, their eyes on it. Uh, so. Yeah, I will. The other thing I will say is like a lot of the terms are already implemented in the three D repository that we run, um, and so de facto um, there's a quite a large community using them in a sort of a public forum and for data archiving for journals and that sort of thing already. But Adam, did you want to? Yeah, uh, thanks, Doug. So I just wanted to to bring up one one particular issue that's problematic, um, and that has to do with identifying uh, 3D resources versus other kinds of media. And um, there, so within uh, Dublin Core, for example, there isn't something that you could use to identify. Um, 3D data, uh, you would have to call it an image or a data set or something like that. Um, and I think we, we thought about a few different options. We did approach Dublin Core with the idea of adding um, digital 3D resource, I think, to um, the uh, Dublin Core type uh, vocabulary. And they basically said that they were unwilling to make changes to Dublin Core. Um, so looking around for, for other ways to deal with this, um, we've been looking at a data site um, because many of the repositories um, that are hosting 3D data and putting DOIs on it um, uh, are going through data site. And when you do that, you have to specify something for resource type general. And there currently is no 3D option there. And so submissions that are going in to get DOIs from data site with 3D data are going under image, they're going under data set, they're going under interactive resource, they're going under software sometimes. Um, and so they're getting lost um, in the uh, sort of data site search engine. Um, and so, so we've approached them with this issue and sort of proposing that maybe the data site schema uh, add a term for 3D resource to cover this, and they 
seems sympathetic to that um, and offered to consider it in their version five, but I don't know what the timeline is on, on version five there. But we're kind of held up because while we, we could create our own term for this, uh, we still have to put something in uh, when we're applying for DOIs with data site. And so it's probably a good idea not to have two different characterizations for the same thing, uh, depending on what field it's going in. So I feel I feel like we're a little bit stuck there and sort of waiting on one of the the big groups to allow 3D to become its own thing. Do you think that if um, we minted a type term in Audubon Core, that having it being part of like an international standard would give any weight to convincing data type to use that? That's data possible. Site. Yeah, I mean it would just it would just have this interim time where we're having to use two fields that are going to say different things like so one would say 3d resource and then you know data site research type general general would say image or data set i was still like i liked david's like suggestion from a while back. I know this would potentially still throw a wrench in part of what Adam, what you're talking about, um, but to almost force the issue with data site, even though they're helping in this case, um, if if they have incoming data sets that did have the Dublin core type field with like technically a not um, standard term, but instead one of like the digital 3D resource term that we had initially tried to propose. If that were, as Steve just mentioned, minted as an Audubon core term and data site had a real couple of records as examples in coming at them, um, I don't know if that helps or complicate. Go ahead, though, David, if, if I'm mangling your suggestion. No, no, no. Uh, it's completely unrelated. So uh, please continue and admit that uh, Adam, maybe you can answer and then I have an unrelated question afterwards. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think um, it's my understanding that when uh, for data sites, resource type general field, you can only use one of their controlled vocabulary terms. So there's no option to do anything else there. If there is a, a standardized term I'm assuming you could go back in and update those records, uh, or I don't know, do they, I can't remember, do they use version? If you update the metadata, does that spawn a new version IRI or, can't, I mean, a version DOI? I can't remember how that works with data site. Yeah, I don't know. No, um, if you, um, it, will, it will update a new version of the data site metadata but uh, um, the DOI is, uh, at, at least from the parts I know, it's in, in your control. So you can you can update this without any changes to the DOI. Uh, and, and so we run um, version DOIs for like version <laughs> uh, uh, instances of a data set. And, but this is uh, for us done on our side and not uh, on data side. And that, so changing the data might spawn a new version, but not the metadata. That's right. Well, then so it you seems can, you, like- you can, you can adjust those fields as you like. And it's like in, 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 the, in the API, you get then um, like the historic versions of, of the data set, of the, of the DOI record metadata. But uh, yeah, uh, that's about it. It seems to me if we just press the, if we just, you know, with the blessing of the 3D task group minted uh, uh, that term class term and then pressed data site to add it to their controlled vocabulary, then you could go back. I don't know, you couldn't catch every record, but you could go back and try to, I'm sure there, I'm sure there's a programmatic way to go in through their API or something and change the type. or at least do it going forward. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that approach. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I feel like there is somewhat of a philosophical, um, there's, there's some space for a sil sil philosophical argument about, 
you know, whether it is valid to choose both, you know, one of the standard Dublin Core type terms as well as 3D resource, uh, since it is possible for something to be a, a 3D image, but it's also possible for something. Anyway, I'm getting I'm getting to to on the tangent. I guess I guess like I would be. I mean, I'm I'm fine with minting a 3D resource term because at least that it lets us, um, uh, you know, make reference to some of the other new terms for discoverability, like uh, imaging modality and um, 3D resource um, file type and that kind of thing. I mean, I think one one thing that came out of this discussion that we had with the DCMI usage board was that they made it clear that you don't have to use a word, a, a term from the type vocabulary with DC type. So I I think it's really a question of is it is it like well known or not? And I think having Tadwig mint the term would at least bump it up a level in terms of that this is not something that just got made up randomly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I like I see I see your point that it's like, okay, if we want it to be, I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, what Adam, I feel like what you're saying is like data site basically has already said they will consider and probably mint a term for 3D resource, which is we just don't know when. And mm -hmm. if we're if we want to get going now by having a you know, a, a custom Audubon core version of that term that at least labels everything that gets in, that gets a DOI and data site to be sort of updated with the term when it becomes available. Maybe, I, I, mean, I mean, I'm just reiterating what people already said. I, so I don't, I don't know. I, I think one possibility given this sort of special situation is to just separate this from the rest of the 3D proposal and fast track it. I mean, if this if this is something that having the term and pressing data site to get it in their pipeline is important, then we could just handle it as a single term addition, and it wouldn't have to wait for the whole three D package to be done. I don't know if that if I'm I don't know if that'd be the best course of action, but like, but it is it it really is a a. a separate can of worms that we've really struggled with. And if we don't make progress with that, it wouldn't have to hold up the 3D proposal and vice versa. Um, just a question, how have you communicated with the, uh, the um, data search group? Um, there's a contact that's on the expert panel that does the reviews of those. Um, and I'm forgetting her name right now, but we've been going through her Okay. Um, hang on you one say, second. Uh, certainly, might might be worth. Um, so I'm, I'm. I was. I'm not involved is the wrong word, but I was following their actions quite a bit, at least until a couple of years ago. So uh, they were quite uh, responsive in my experience to to any issues or, or things, and um, uh, so it might be worth just to put it up on the agenda again, just to to make a dedicated issue in the issue trackers for the schema, where they uh, track like all the new suggestions for for terms and uh, adjustments to the schema. Um, so um, and looking at the release history, they usually release like every one to two years, and the current version was released in, okay, that's, I think 2001, if I remember correctly. Where do I have to, yeah. And um, so- um, 2001 or 2021? Uh, sorry, 2021, of course. Uh, yeah, um, and, and and so the, the, the resource type general was added with the latest edition. So that was latest uh, added in, in, in the uh, um, version 4.4. So I guess they, they do realize that they, since it's such a new uh, concept there, um, they do have some gaps that they initially overlooked. And um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure they, they're interested in uh, expanding this and, and adding it uh, relatively quickly, talking like 
one year, maybe two year time frames here, but uh, it's, it's certainly a lot more, um, uh, yeah, useful to to go that direction and not try to to go over du uh, Dublin Core. So I, I am uh, in the interest of time. We yes, we scheduled sorry, yeah. for no, it's fine. I, I'm really happy. This seems like a really productive discussion we're having. Um, we we did only sign up for an hour and uh, and we're past that. Um, and and if we didn't have another group another session coming up, I'd say we could just let this run as long as we wanted. Um, but we should at least in the next five minutes try to wrap this up um, because I'm going to have to restart the meeting for the mids group, which is coming up in 20 minutes from now. So. Um, does any so I guess I would just end by like throwing back to the 3D task group like consider the option of just of if you think it would be helpful just go in the issue tracker and and propose adding the class term the way you want it to be <laughs> and we could if nest if it would be helpful we could try to fast track that and have you could have something in your hand to go to the data site people and try to get it into their next um the, the pipeline for their next release so i don't know okay. anyway think about that yeah and, and ideally if you already have like a if you propose this with, with like a, a good definition of everything for all they have to do is realize oh yeah that is something that's missing and okay we can just take it as it is and and, and join it that's probably um less of a struggle and uh, uh, compared to they have to connect with other people to come up with the proper definition yeah i think we can use what we sent to dublin core um which is yeah. pretty well spelled out and just yeah put it up on there so i'm i'm happy to work with people to make data site notice us and and in the meantime then this was my other question was really quick at the, at the end now um uh, you mentioned that there are like the different approaches some put it as software some as image some as uh, like uh, other um uh, uh, do you have like a recommendation which one it should be uh would this would this make sense or does it depend like on a specific file format or application or whatever so I think we were trying to get everything lumped into something that would just be 3D resource. So uh, rather than image or other or data set. Um, so it would be on the level of image, um, this resource type. Yeah, no, my, no, sorry, my, uh, my thought was um, until this 3D resource becomes available, uh, uh, do you have like a recommendation for people who still want to publish their, their 3D images to say, okay, go with image or go with the um, other? I think most of them are currently called data set. Okay. Um, but we could do a little checking and see which one is dominating right now. It's either image or data set. I think we meant DOIs as image, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but I'll have to check. I think we had documented some of this too over in issue 243 for the actual term that we sent to Dublin Core might have changed from some order between 3D digital resource, digital 3D resource, something else. And if starting fresh uh, keeps it separate, that makes sense too. Yeah, I think if uh, avoiding starting it with a number is probably good just for, I think, validity of XML. <laughs> Yep. container elements and stuff like that so okay well this is great I, I i feel really optimistic about like next year when we have this meeting being able to say the 3d uh group is done so <laughs> let's press on and uh thank you everyone for for sticking this out and for coming and uh i guess at this point i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording <laughs>